Hey, praise the Lord. It is I, Brother Clinton, once again, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. John 4.24, it is written, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God, the Almighty God, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Maker of heaven and earth, the only true and living God, will be worshipped in only one way. His way, in spirit and in truth. And those who are thinking to worship Him in some other way than His way are worshipping in vain. They're offering strange fire. And it's happening all over the place in various churches that call themselves Christians because they believe the doctrine of their denomination or their religious organization instead of the doctrine of Christ. And if you want to know what happens to someone who offers strange fire unto the Lord, go back to the 16th chapter of Numbers and see what happened to Korah and all his company. So, it is written in the scripture, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. In other words, does not have God. This is in Second John, verse 9. So, that's the reason that I'm here, and I hope that that's the reason that you're here with me as well, to learn of the doctrine of Christ, to come away from the nonsense and the lies and the smoke screens and the deceptions of the various religious organizations and denominations of men, and to learn what the Bible says about how to worship God in spirit and in truth. And what I want to talk to you about today is what the Bible says about betrothal and marriage. And I've spoken a lot about marriage here on this channel. In fact, you're watching this video in the midst of a playlist called Marriage and Divorce. And I forget how many videos are on this playlist right now, but there's, I think, somewhere around 50. And it's very important that we understand what the Bible says about marriage. Number one, because it's an important and integral part of most of our lives. And also because the whole Bible is about a marriage from the beginning to the end. So... Uh, and if I may say so, the whole reason that God created man in his image and then took the woman out of the man and brought the woman back to the man, pardon me, brought the woman to the man and he took her in marriage, the whole reason that God did that and made a wife for Adam and then he took her to be his wife was to illustrate God's relationship with his people that would come to pass throughout time and is even still now unfolding. And eventually... The wedding, which shall take place in the kingdom of heaven after this life is passed. Praise the Lord. So, the whole Bible is about a marriage, and it's very important that we understand what the Bible says about marriage. So, what I'd like to talk to you about in this video is something that I was just discussing with some blessed brothers earlier this evening, and that is, what is the difference between betrothal and engagement? Betrothal and engagement. Because the Bible speaks about betrothal, like, for instance, Mary and Joseph were betrothed when she became pregnant. She became with child. And, and she was his betrothed wife. She was his wife and he was her husband, but he had not known her yet. So they were betrothed. And that's kind of confusing to many people in this world and, and to many people in the churches. And I understand that because when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were filled with the nonsense of Egypt. They were Israel, but they were still filled with all the nonsense and traditions of Egypt. So they had to be washed. And that's part of the reason that they spent 40 years in the wilderness before they could enter into the promised land. And so here we are in our little wilderness, learning to get cleansed from all the nonsense that we learned in Egypt. And Egypt is this world and the customs of this world. So we're here to learn today about what the difference is between betrothal and engagement. So I want to share with you a passage of the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Well, maybe 1 through 4. Blessed be the reading of the word of the Lord. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not so on and so forth. This is a passage of the scripture wherein God was speaking to the people of Israel about 
the people that used to live in that land that they lived in at the time. They were called Canaanites. And those people were a wicked and sinful and ungodly people. And God specifically addressed two of the things that those Canaanites were accustomed to doing. They were accustomed to using astrology, for he said, Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. Astrology, you know, the zodiac. You know, today is the, the whatever date it is. Or what does the zodiac say about me today? That's ridiculous. Okay, that's witchcraft and sorcery. And so he spoke about that, and he also spoke about the practice of making idols, making graven images in the shape of men, and then worshiping those images. Okay, um, there. This passage of scripture is not talking about what people refer to as a Christmas tree. It's talking about graven images that are made in the likeness of a man and worshipped. But that's not really what I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about is the fact that in verse 2 it says, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the heathen. Israel were in their land. The people of Israel were in their land that God had given to them and dispossessed seven nations greater and mightier than they were to put them in that land. Israel came into that land and they completely destroyed nations of giants by the power of God and many other sinful people so that they could inherit that land. And the people that, that used to live in that land, there was still a remnant of those people left because Israel failed to, to slay all of them like they should have. If you go back to the book of Joshua, you can see that there were some of them that they didn't slay. So there were some of the Canaanites still mixed in among them, which became a snare to them and a thorn in their eyes as the Lord said that they would be. And so they began to learn the ways of the heathen. They began to learn their ways. They began to, they began to marry their daughters and to, uh, to let their daughters marry their sons. And just as it's written in Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you do that, you'll learn of their way. They'll teach you how to worship their gods, and then my wrath will be kindled against you, and I'll destroy you. So that's what was happening, in the day, even in the days of Jeremiah, when Israel had already dwelt in the land for hundreds of years. And so God said, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Okay, and then in verse 3 he said, For the customs of the people are vain. The customs of the people are vain. Now keep that in mind as I begin speaking to you about the difference between engagement and betrothal. Betrothal is something that we find in the Bible, as I explained to you earlier. Joseph and Mary, they were betrothed. Mary was Joseph's wife even before they came together. Okay? She was his wife. He was her husband. If you don't believe me, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. And let's read verses 18 through 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, she was espoused, which means the same thing as betrothed. Before they came, pardon me, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Okay, he was a just man, so that means he believed and obeyed the law of God, and he thought that she had been made pregnant by another man than he. And to be honest, I would have thought the same thing, and so would you. So he was, uh, he was not willing to make her a public example, so he was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph understood, and he kept her as his wife, and then after she gave birth to her firstborn son, he went in unto her, and she bore him other sons and daughters, as a good wife should. And so the Bible says here that Joseph and Mary were espoused or betrothed. And you know, the Bible also says that we are espoused to one husband as well, even Christ. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, Paul wrote. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Well, let's pay attention to this. For I have espoused you to one husband, 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now Paul was writing to the saints at Corinth, but those of us who are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Ghost and abiding in the Word of God, we can also take this letter as addressed to us. So Paul also said in a different place that he was, he was a father to many, and indeed he was a father to many. He called Timothy his son, even though he wasn't his natural son. But he called Timothy his son because he was his spiritual son, because he begat Timothy by the gospel. And Paul has begotten many of us by the gospel. Many of us believed the gospel that Paul wrote about, that he got from Jesus Christ, whether we read it in the Bible or whether it was preached to us from someone else who had read the Bible. And so we owe that reverence or that respect to Paul also as our father in the Lord. Okay? Now, we don't call him Father Paul like they do in the pagan churches, like the, the Catholic and some Protestant churches. And Paul, the Apostle of Christ, never asked anybody to call him Father Paul. And if anyone had, he would have rebuked them straightway. Because Jesus said, Call no man your father on earth, because you have one father which is in heaven. I believe that's Matthew 23, 9. However, the fact remains that Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy, and to the saints at Corinth. And so he is to us who have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he says, For I have espoused you to one husband. In the same way that Paul, being our father in Christ, because he begat us through the gospel, the gospel by which we have been born again, begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, was given to us, at least in part, by him and also the other apostles as well, whom God had ordained to begin preaching the gospel in all the whole world. So he, as our father in Christ Jesus, humanly speaking, our father, our spiritual father, but you know what I mean, in Christ Jesus, he espoused us to one husband. He, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who believed and were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, he thereby hath espoused us to one husband in the same way that a man would come to another man and say, I love your daughter, I'd like to marry her. And so the woman's father, or pardon me, I should say the maiden's father, says, okay, such and such is my dowry. And the man gives the other man the dowry. The man gives the, the, the damsel's father the dowry, and the damsel's father gives to him his daughter. And so the damsel's father has espoused his daughter to this man. And it can also be said that this man has espoused this man's daughter to himself. She is now his property. Okay, She has now been purchased from her father's house, and she pertains to her new husband's house. Okay, This is what happened, undoubtedly, with Joseph and Mary, because this is the way the scripture in the Old Testament describes it to be done. That's what a dowry is. It is a payment that a man gives to the father of a young virgin that he desires. And then the woman is then, if, if the father of the, of the virgin approves, then she is given to this man. And she is no more uh, living under, under her father's roof in her father's house to serve her father's house. She is now living in her husband's house to serve her husband's house. This is how a man takes a wife. Okay, that's a betrothal. And then at some point in the future, he will marry her. Okay, what do I mean by marry? Well, marry is a word, or marriage, is, a, is a, in its generic sense, is a word that means the joining together of two or more things or people. Okay, like I've said many times, before, several times before, my mother used to work in a Denny's restaurant many decades ago. And she used to do something that they call marrying the ketchups. Remember back in the way in the old days when they used to put a ketchup bottle on your table at a restaurant? It wasn't a, those little sanitary packets like you get nowadays because people weren't gross enough back then to spit in the ketchup or anything like that. People didn't think of stuff like that back then. I know, weird, huh? But they used to have ketchup bottles. And so they had this little white plastic tube that the waitresses would use to marry the ketchups, which means that they would take one ketchup bottle, which was half full, and they would take another ketchup bottle, which was half full, and they would put the, the one on top of the other on top of that plastic tube, and all the ketchup would run down into one bottle to give you one full bottle and one empty bottle to throw the empty bottle away. That was called marrying the ketchups, because you're making two into one. That's what the word marriage means. And so, in the context of marriage between a man and a woman, what makes marriage between a man and a woman? Well, two things. The Bible says that 
God made man, male and female. And he said, For this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so when God made the woman for the man in the beginning, the first woman and the first man, the man saw the woman, and he desired her, and so he said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now, he said to her, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And it's important for us to see that, to note that. Because he didn't just say, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Because if he had just said that, then he, we, we might think that he said that just because she came forth from his body, which she did. But he didn't say, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In other words, he took her with his word. Adam was the king of the earth. He was the king of the earth. He was the ruler of the earth. God had ordained it to be so when he created him. He said, let us make man in our image, speaking of his son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world 4,000 years later to make man in the image of God. So God said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over everything. Let them, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing that breatheth and moveth upon the earth. So Adam was the king of the earth. And he saw this woman that God had made from his rib and she pleased him well. And so he said, this is now bone of my bone. In other words, I take her right now to be part of my flesh. I make her part of me with this decree from my mouth. That's what Adam did. He was a king. He was the king of all the earth, and he made a decree. He said, this is mine now. This is, part, this is not only my property, this is part of my body. I'm making her part of my body right now with my word. That's what he said. And then he knew Eve, his wife, and she bore him children. Okay, That's how a man and a woman are married. A man and a woman are not married by a priest or a justice of the peace or a pastor or whatever. A man and a woman are married when the man says... I take you to be my wife. And then he takes her into the marriage bed and he marries her. When a man takes her into the marriage bed and he knows her carnally, that's marrying her. That's making their flesh one. That's joining their flesh together so that they become one. Now, if a man doesn't take a woman to be his wife and he just jumps in bed with her and shares his flesh with her, that doesn't make them one. That's called fornication and it's against the law. But when a man takes a woman to be his wife and then he goes into the marriage bed with her and he knows her and he joins his flesh with her flesh, that makes them one flesh. And that's what betrothal or espousal is. Now, what is engagement? Engagement, remember when Jeremiah said by the word of the Lord, learn not the ways of the heathen for the customs of the people are vain. That's what engagement is. Engagement, just to save myself some time and trouble, I decided to just look it up on Google. I just typed in engagement definition. And this is what it says. Number one, a formal agreement to get married. Number two, an arrangement to do something or go somewhere at a fixed time. Okay, that's what an engagement is. So today, in our pagan heathenistic society, there are many vain and wicked traditions that people follow, and they don't see them as vain and wicked, of course. They see them as normal, because you just do that. It's what everybody does. So when a man wants to marry a woman these days, he gets down on one knee, generally, in front of her, uh, with a ring in his hand, and he says, I love you, will you marry me? And she says, well, yes, I'll marry you. And then he rejoices, and he puts the ring on her finger, and he stands up and probably kisses her, and they rejoice. Okay, and that's nice and everything, uh, because now they're engaged to be married. But they're not married, and they're not betrothed, and they're not in a marriage relationship. They have just agreed that someday, or maybe on a certain date, that they will get married. And the reason that it's important for us to distinguish this is because when a man betroths a wife unto himself, he may not put her away. He may not divorce her, unless... She has been found guilty of having been with another man before their wedding. This is spelled out for us in the book of Deuteronomy. So let's, let's go there. I have it on my screen in front of me. In Deuteronomy 
chapter 22. Let's start in verse 13. It says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her... No, let's not go there right now. Let's go to Deuteronomy 24 first, and then we'll come back to this. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy 24. When a man hath taken a wife and married her. When a man hath taken a wife and married her. Okay. And is called a conjunction. And it joins two things together. When you have and in the middle of a couple of things, that usually means that they're separate from one another. Not always, but most of the time it means they're separate from one another. And that's the case here. When a man hath taken a wife, that's one thing, and married her, that's another thing. Taking a wife is going to the father of a young virgin and saying, your daughter pleases me well, I'd like to marry her. And the man says, okay, here's my dowry, here's my price. And the man agrees to it, and he gives the damsel's father the dowry. And she becomes his wife. He takes her from her father's house into his house. Okay, And at some point in the future, however long that might be, you know, three days, five days, two weeks, a year, whatever, he will marry her, which means that he will take her into the marriage bed and know her carnally. He will take her and join his flesh with her flesh. And the reason for the betrothal period, the reason that a man takes a wife in Israel and then marries her at some point afterward, is to prove her faithfulness to her husband and, and the fact that she is a virgin, like her father told him when he, when he took her, okay, when he took her to wife. And so if it comes to pass, we're going back to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, if it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let her write, pardon me, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Now, it says, And it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her. What is this uncleanness? When a man hath taken a wife and married her, he's in the act of marrying her in the marriage bed. And it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her. We know from the scripture, by revelation of the scripture, that this is talking about the same thing that Jesus was talking about when he used the word fornication. Okay, if we go, let me just go in my uh, Bible gateway to Matthew chapter 19. And the Pharisees were arguing with Jesus, as they always were. And so they say unto him, verse 7, Matthew 19, verse 7, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. So Jesus said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. In other words, Jesus made it very clear that there is only one reason that any man can put away his wife and be free to marry another, and that is for the cause of fornication. Well, what is fornication? It is that uncleanness that is spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So if he hath found some uncleanness in her, this makes it clear to us from the revelation of the scripture that he had taken a wife and in the act of marrying her he discovered that something was very wrong. He discovered that a certain part of her anatomy, which is called a hymen, has been broken. A hymen, if I may put it this way, is kind of a little safety seal that God has ordained to be in the anatomy of a woman which is broken when she marries and her husband enters into her secret place. So if her hymen is broken, that means that somebody has been there. And if the man who purchased her for his wife 
purchased her under the condition that she was a virgin. And then when he goes to marry her, he finds out that she's not a virgin. Then he has the right to give her a, a writing of divorcement and send her out of his house. That is the only, that is the only provision in God's law for a man to put away his wife. And of course, there is no provision in God's law for a woman to put away her husband under any circumstances. So as we go to Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, and let's start in verse 13 again. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, okay, that's what we just read about in the 24th chapter, and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Okay, let's stop there because I feel the need to explain some things here. If any man take a wife and go in unto her, okay, that's taking a wife and marrying her, going in unto her is marrying her, and hate her, which means the same thing as he, she hath found no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her. How do we know that? Because it says in verse 14, he says, I found her not a maid. All right, now let's clarify some terms here. A maid, the words maid, virgin, handmaid, maiden, these are all words that we find in the scripture to describe a young female who has not known a man. She lives in her father's house. She's never known a man. She can be called a maid, a handmaid. Um, no, I'm sorry, not a handmaid, because a handmaid could be used for a wife. So she's called a maid or a virgin or a damsel. A maid, a virgin, or a damsel. These are three words that we find in the scripture to describe a young female who has never been with a man. So, if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her, okay, and bring up an evil name upon her. Now remember, let's let's go back to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, where the Bible says that Joseph was minded to put away his wife privily, privily, because he didn't want to bring reproach upon her. So, he had that option to put her away privily. Also, another option that a man had in Israel, if he went into his wife and found that she was not a virgin, was to bring her to the door of her father's house and have her stoned with stones and burned with fire because she was a whore, because she wasn't a virgin like her father said that she was. But Joseph wasn't willing to do that with Mary. He was willing to put her away privily, which he also had the right to do, according to the law. So we read in Deuteronomy 22.13, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders in the city, pardon me, unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. But if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then shall they bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. Praise the Lord. So, if this man purchases a maid from her father, her father says, yes, my daughter is a virgin, and he purchases her, he takes her to wife, and sometime after that, he goes in unto her to marry her, and he discovers that, hey, wait a minute, you're not a virgin. Your hymen is broken. Someone's been with you. You've known a man before me. So he brings her to her father's house, and he brings up this, this evil report against her. If it's true, then she is to be stoned in the door of her house, as it's written. Um, in verse 21, Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. 
But if it be not true, then the father and mother of the damsel shall bring out the token of her virginity and show it unto the elders of the city. And quite obviously, being that it's a cloth, this cloth was pressed upon a certain part of her anatomy to show that that safety seal which God put upon her body is still intact. And so then they will punish the man because he had brought up an evil report upon one of the virgins of Israel. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 and 2 is all about. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, except it be for fornication. This is the only reason that a man can put away his wife is if she has been found to be unfaithful to him or have been with another man before he marries her. Now, this is something that a lot of you are going to disagree with, but it is verily so. A woman is not a woman when she... A, a female doesn't become a woman when she's 18 years old. A female becomes a woman when she passes puberty. The Bible calls this passing the flower of her age. It's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's just go there because I don't remember exactly the verse number and I want to show it to you. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Just give me a moment to find the verse. It's here in verse 36. But if any man think that he, that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Okay. If she pass the flower of her age. Many young women pass the flower of their age when they are 11 or 12 years old. According to the Bible, according to God, if a woman begins to, once a female passes her puberty and she begins to menstruate, that means that her body is ready to bear children. That's just obvious. It's kind of a no-brainer. The reason that a woman menstruates is because she's uh, able to bear children. Her reproductive system is functioning. Okay, that doesn't happen when she's six or seven or eight because she's a little girl. But when she passes the flower of her age, she's old enough to bear children. And obviously, if she's old enough to bear children, then she's old enough to marry. She's old enough to be purchased from her father's house to serve a husband. So we need to get out of our minds this false reality that has been given us by the Roman system that if a person isn't 18 years old, they're not an adult yet, because that's a lie. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody to marry a 15-year-old woman because it's against the law in many places, and you could wind up in jail for doing that. Okay, And you could be called a sex offender for the rest of your life for doing that. So I don't recommend that. But I have to let you know in the name of Jesus Christ, and as a minister ordained by him, that although the Roman law says that you have to be 18 years old to be an adult, God doesn't. God lets us know when we're adults by the time that we pass puberty. When we pass puberty and we can bear children, a woman can bear children and a man can procreate, that's when we are adults. Okay, So that's when we should start learning how to act like an adult. And I have other videos on this channel about that, so if you have more questions about that, please let me know and I'll be happy to send you a link to a video that will address your question. So when, we talk, when the Bible speaks about a young maid or a maiden or a damsel, that a man would take to wife, it's very likely that she could be 11 or 12 or 13 years old. All right, That's not child abuse. It's God's law. Okay, If when a young woman is 12 or 13 years old, she's old enough to marry, according to God. That's God's law, not mine. I didn't make it up. If you have a problem with that, take it up with him. All right? But we learn from the book of Jasher that Rebecca was 10 years old when Abraham's servant was sent to go and receive for his, his, his son Isaac a wife from the house of Laban. And the book of Jasher says that Rebekah was 10 years old. Now, the book of Jasher isn't given by inspiration of God. It's more a historical account of many of the things that happened during the time of the Old Testament. Um, so when I say that Rebekah was 10 years old, that's not given by inspiration of God, but it's just it's in a book with you know, historical information uh, that was pertaining to the things that happened during that time. So, and that, that's not unusual at all. Okay, and I'll, although that seems very unusual to us in this day and age, because we're raised in a Roman world where we somehow imagine 
that if you're not 18, you're not an adult yet. That's kind of crazy. When you're 18, you've been an adult for five years already or six years. So that's a lot of the reason for the, the confusion and the problems that we have in modern society because we have grown men and women who are old enough to marry and have children that society is treating like children and, and encouraging them to act like children and ride around on skateboards and play video games and, and, and you know just do silly stuff like that that children do. But Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so we need to learn how to act like men and women when we become men and women and stop letting society tell us that we're still children when we're 15, 16, 17 years old. Because we're not. A young man who is 16 years old is a grown man. He should be thinking about marrying and starting a family. Now again, I'm not saying that we should start marrying when we're under 18 because that's against the law of the state. And we don't want to wind up in jail or in prison for that. We don't want to be called sex offenders because we married someone who was under 18. But just so that you know, a person isn't an adult when they're 18. A person is an adult when they pass puberty. So that's what the Bible is speaking about when it says a maid, just so you can get this, so you can get an idea of what's going on here. It says, if, if any man take a wife, Deuteronomy 22, starting verse 13 again, if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid, which means she wasn't a virgin. And it's very likely that this woman was a young teenager. Okay, So that's very important for us to understand. She was a young teenager, and for that reason he presumed, and also because of the fact that her father told her that she was a maid, he presumed that she had never been with a man. And all of a sudden he takes her into the marriage bed to marry her, and he finds out that her hymen is broken, so she's not a virgin. So that's what betrothal is. It was introduced into the marriage law in the days of Moses. It didn't exist before the days of Moses. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, that it wasn't, from the beginning, it wasn't so. I believe it was in Matthew 19, or maybe it was in Mark. Let me just check real quick. Yes, in, in Matthew 19, verse 8. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. See, so Abraham didn't, betroth Sarah unto himself, and Isaac did not betroth Rebekah unto himself. Neither did Jacob betroth his wives unto himself. Well, he did in a way because he worked for Laban for seven years for Rachel, and he had to work another seven years for her because uh, her father beguiled him. But that's a different story because that was how he, he that, that's how Jacob married uh, Laban's daughters. And perhaps it was by revelation before the law came, I don't know. But after Israel went down into Egypt for 400 years and came up out of Egypt and God um, led them out by the hand of Moses, they had become a great and mighty and numerous nation as the stars of the, of the heaven for multitude. And so because they were a rebellious and a stiff-necked people, God instituted into the law, his own law, the betrothal. And this is what is being spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and 24, as we just read. Before that, there is no talk of betrothal. In fact, let me just do a search here. I'm on Bible Gateway. And I'm just going to search for the word betroth. The first mention of it is in Exodus. If she please not her master with betrothed her to himself, then let her... Then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing I have dealt deceitfully with her. And in Exodus 21, 9, And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. So this is speaking about a man who purchases a maid for himself or for his son. In Exodus chapter 21, after we read about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and after we read about God giving the Ten Commandments in the 20th chapter of Exodus, now, in Exodus chapter 21, is the first time we see the word betroth or betrothed. That's the first time that the word occurs in the scripture. It's not, it doesn't occur in the book of Genesis. It doesn't occur until Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God saw that his people Israel were a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. And so, in order so that God would have his own provision and his own law to keep the hard-hearted and stiff-necked people of Israel out of his kingdom to keep them from inhabiting his kingdom and defiling it, 
he put in the law this betrothal period so that the husband would have a period of time, whatever time it is that he chooses, to prove his bride to be faithful before he would take her into a lifelong covenant with him by going in unto her, marrying her. As we can see in the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, what did the Lord do? He said, because the tree of life was in the midst of that garden, and he said, lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever, we need to put them out of the garden. He said, let us. And when he said, let us, of course, he was talking to his host of angels that were around about him. He wasn't talking to another God, God the Son. He was talking to his angels. And so Adam was put out of the garden. And a flaming sword was put out of the garden. Put, pardon me, it was put at the, at the entrance of the garden. A flaming sword that turned every way. And that sword, that flaming sword which turned every way, is this word. And this word is the only way back into the garden. Those who read and obey this word are the only ones who are going to enter back into the paradise from which Adam and his wife were expelled. Praise the Lord. And he did that because the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and he didn't want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever in the state that they were in. And so it was necessary for God to put them out of the garden and create one way back into the garden. This way in spirit and in truth. Just like I said in the beginning of this video. Praise the Lord. So when God made a great and mighty nation of people out of the seed of Abraham, and he sent them down into Egypt, into the furnace of affliction for 400 years, and then sent Moses to, 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 to lead them out of Egypt, then he saw that because they were a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people, that it would be necessary for him <clears throat> to make a way for those few among them who were obedient to enter into his kingdom, but for those that were wicked and rebellious to be kept out of his kingdom. And so God put this in his own law for him, not for men, not for men to put away their wives. Yes, it is a provision for men to put away their wives if they are guilty of fornication, which means that, they're found that, they're, that, that the woman is found not to be a virgin when he marries her. All right, let me just... Expound on that again just a little bit. We're talking about a man who goes to a woman's father. The woman's father says that she's a virgin. He gives her the dowry. The man takes the young maid to his house. And then he goes into her to marry her and finds out that she's not a virgin. That's what fornication is. That's what he, he has found some uncleanness in her means. She has found no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. She's not a virgin. He wanted a virgin. He went to her father. Her father said she was a virgin. He purchased her with a dowry. And now it comes to pass that she, he finds out that she's not a virgin anymore. So she finds no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her. All right? So, pardon me, let, let me regather my thoughts because I, I got off on a... Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've got several things going on in my brain right now at the same time. Help me, Father, to, to speak these things in the order that thou wouldst have them spoken. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. This is why God put betrothal in his law. Because the time is going to come, like I showed you from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that, that Paul said that I have betrothed you, I have espoused you unto one husband, even Christ. The time is going to come when we are going to stand before our husband. And if it comes to pass that he finds no favor with a, or pardon me, that we find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in us, then he has the right to give us a writing of divorcement and send us out of his house. See, when we go to the wedding supper, or pardon me, when we go to the wedding, those of us who are baptized in his name and filled with his spirit, when we go to the wedding and we have not on a wedding garment, we shall be bound hand and foot and cast out of the palace. And this is why Jesus said, There be many standing here among you that shall not taste of death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So those of us who are the bride of Christ, it's not over yet. We have to prove ourselves faithful to him. And when we stand before him, if we have been found guilty of fornication, fornicating with other gods, like people who believe in a trinity do, because they worship other gods that are no gods, because God isn't a trinity, He's one. 
And people who worship a deity called God the Sun are worshiping Tammuz, the bastard son of Nimrod and Semiramis, the king and queen of Babylon. That's who they're worshiping. They might not realize that. Well, they, they surely don't realize that. But they don't realize it because they're blind. They've been lied to and they believe the lies because they didn't do the one thing that Jesus, us, that Jesus commanded us to do. Abide in his word. He said, if you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Rather, he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. If you continue in God's word, even if you have been taught all your life that he's a trinity of persons, if you continue in his word, he will show you that he's not a trinity of persons and that there is no such thing as God the Son. God the Son doesn't exist. God the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. The Holy Spirit is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. And the Son of God is just that. He's the Son of God, the man Christ Jesus. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was in Christ. It's just that simple. One God and one man. And God is in the man. Praise the Lord. So, those who will have been found guilty of fornication will be handed a bill of divorcement and kicked out of the house. That's why God put this provision in his law. It wasn't so men could divorce their wives. It is so he would have the provision in his own law to lawfully put those away who professed to know him, who professed to love him, who professed to serve him, but went to their fornication centers every week with a big phallus on the roof, which they call a steeple, and worshipped strange gods. And they called their strange gods Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But they're devils. They're not God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. They're devils. So praise the Lord. Um, that's why God put this provision in His law. That's what except for fornication means. That's what if, he, if she find no favor in His eyes because he, because he hath found some uncleanness in her means. It doesn't mean if a man marries a wife and they live together as husband and wife for a little while and then he decides he doesn't like her anymore so he wants to divorce her because she burned the bacon at breakfast or whatever the case may be. It doesn't mean if a man and a woman live together in marriage for a while and then she is unfaithful with some other man. That's not what that means. That's called adultery. And the punishment for adultery is death by stoning. It is not divorce and remarriage. So if you've lived together with a wife and she has committed adultery, that's very unfortunate, but that doesn't give you the right to put her away and marry another woman. And so getting back to engagement, engagement is nothing more than setting a date for something. Let's go back to that definition from Google, because I thought Google in this case said it very well. Number one, a formal agreement to get married. Number two, an arrangement to do something or go somewhere at a fixed time. So, when a man and a woman get engaged, they go through these rituals, these heathenistic rituals, um, the man bows before the woman, which is confusion and perversion, because the man is the head of the woman. It doesn't pertain to a man to bow before a woman. It doesn't pertain to a man to bow before a woman. But that's what we are taught in this hedonistic society where women are worshipped as gods. And men are like the little puppy dogs that just need whatever the woman has. And the women are raised this way. The women are raised in this world to think that they have the beauty, they have the, you know, the physical beauty, the, the physical body that men desire, so they can manipulate men to do whatever they want. Women raise their daughters to, to, uh, to, to look at it this way. To, to raise their daughters, telling them things like, you have a beautiful body and men want what you have, so all you have to do is just pick the man that you want, pick one with lots of money and stuff like that, and then you can just flaunt your body in front of him and stuff and have sex with him for a little while, and all of a sudden you can just go to court and tell him you don't, you know, tell him you don't like him anymore, you, you don't want to be married to him anymore, and just go to court and get a divorce, and then he'll have to pay for you to raise his children. Um, that's what a lot of women in this world teach their children. That's what the television teaches. That's what the, the, music, and Holly, the music industry in Hollywood teaches. So that's what young women learn, and that's from the devil. Same thing as the Canaanite society. And so and it's the same thing as Sodom and Gomorrah. And so um, this happens, and then women become accustomed to this thing of being worshipped. And I'm not speaking against women. I'm not, I'm not demeaning women at all. Women are beautiful, and women are creatures of God just like we as men are. And we all, male or female, are worthy of honor and dignity and respect. And God doesn't love men more than he loves women. 
However, everything in its place, every person in his place. The, the man is the head of the woman. This is what God's word says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay. Now, who's I in this sentence? It's Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. This man has, he is a partaker of the highest office in the church of Jesus Christ, except for Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the king, and he ordains some men to be apostles. So an apostle is one in the kingdom of God with the highest office in the entire kingdom except for the king. That's what Paul and the other apostles were. So he said, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So the head of the woman is the man. It does not pertain to a man to bow down before a woman, to grovel before her and ask her if she will be his wife. Now, it's a good thing for a man, if he loves a woman, to ask her if she would be his wife. You know, to sit down and talk to her and say, would you like to be my wife? And, and get, you know, get her opinion, and if she'd like to be his wife, then he can proceed to marry her. It would be very uncomfortable to marry a woman who doesn't want to be your wife. But at the same time, a, a man, a man of God, does not bow down before a woman. He does not kneel before a woman. We kneel before the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not kneel before a woman. Um, and so... You know, the, the hedonistic society, they do this. And then they offer a ring to this woman. And for whatever reason they do that, I'm not going to get into all the details of the history of it and all that stuff, but wedding rings are pertaining to sorcery. They're around and, it, and it's, uh, you know, they're a ring and they pertain to the snake eating its own tail and eternity and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can look it up if you want to. Uh, and there's a video on this channel about it, but it won't go into that much detail about the, the satanic history of it either. You, if you want to know about that stuff, you'll have to just go to Google and look it up. I'm sure there's a wealth of information there. But I can tell you this. The, the, the act of a man giving a woman a ring has absolutely nothing to do with them being married. It doesn't have anything to do with a marriage. It doesn't make them married. When a man gives a woman either an engagement ring or a wedding ring, you know, sometimes there are sets of two, an engagement ring and a wedding ring. My mother had those. Uh, well, she still does. Um, those have nothing to do with marriage. Those don't make anybody married. Um, but people think that they do because of the tradition you know, of the heathen. Um, is it a sin to have a wedding ring? I'm not going to say that it is. Uh, it's... Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. For, for somebody that doesn't understand the history of a wedding ring and, and has one on, I'm not going to tell them that they're sinning by having a wedding ring. But I highly encourage you to look it up and, and find out exactly what a wedding ring means. And when you do that, you might decide to take it off um, with all due respect to your spouse because it's not a disrespectful thing to your spouse to take off a wedding ring and throw it away um, because it, it has absolutely nothing to do with your marriage. Your marriage to your spouse is a blood covenant between you and your spouse and God. It's a blood covenant. It doesn't have anything to do with that ring. It doesn't have anything to do with the pastor or priest or justice of the peace that that oversaw the ceremony or that you know repeated the words do you and do you it doesn't have anything to do with any of that it has to do with you and your spouse and god entering into a blood covenant with one another when you the man said unto your wife i take you to be my wife and then you took her into the marriage bed and you married her that's what makes you husband and wife so giving a ring to someone doesn't have anything to do with um uh, a a marriage it could it, it signifies your engagement which is which means that you are setting a date now to be married and when you when that date comes and you get married then you'll be married but until that time you're not married and you're not betrothed because you haven't purchased her from her father's house um, as if you know as if as in the east when they when they did that and they purchased a young virgin from her father's house that's probably not the case with you if you're listening to this video and in the West, like the United States, Canada, um, Europe, you know, anywhere in the West. That's probably not the case. Um, in fact, in a lot of cases, the woman that you're considering marrying is probably not a virgin. And that's fine. She doesn't have to be a virgin for you to marry her. But if you desire a virgin and you purchase one from her father, and then you find out that he lied to you and she wasn't a virgin, that's a problem. And that's where the divorce comes in. 
Praise the Lord. So having said that, that's the difference between um, engagement and betrothal. Betrothal is a real thing that is given to us in the law of God, which means when a man goes to a, a, a maid's father and he purchases her with a dowry and takes her to be his wife. That's what betrothal means. Then they're betrothed or espoused. Betrothal and espousal are two words that mean the same thing. Engagement is a thing that the heathen do to promise to get married at a certain date or just sometime in the future. That's not betrothal. If two people get engaged, a man says to a woman, will you marry me? And she says, yes, I'll marry you. And he puts a ring on her finger. You know, he bows his knee before her and puts a ring on her finger. They're engaged. Okay, woohoo, that's wonderful and everything. But they're not betrothed. And if at some point after that, uh, they decide that they don't want to marry each other, that's fine. They don't have to marry each other because they were never betrothed. They never entered into a marriage covenant. Unless, unless the man said unto her, you know, if he says, will you be my wife? And she says, yes, I'll be your wife. And he puts a ring on her finger and he says unto her, okay, I now take you to be my wife. And then they go into one another. But if he says, I take you to be my wife, then she is his wife. And they are betrothed until he goes in unto her and marries her. Then they are married. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This has been a long message and I didn't expect it to be. But there were a lot of things that I had to cover. So I hope this has been a blessing to those of you out there who are my brethren in Christ Jesus. If you're not yet in Christ Jesus and this all sounded kind of weird to you, that's because you're unfamiliar with the Word of God so far, and I encourage you to abide in the Word of God. As Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Brother Clinton. I'm out for now. Go in peace.